Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session of Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And a lot of things are happening in Jamaica. A lot of things are unfolding. We are unraveling, as it were, as a society. Now, we have been talking for a long time. We have been saying for a long time. We have been affirming that Jamaica in, is indeed a criminal state and that our politicians, I'm not suggesting you now that all our politicians are criminal, right? Because far from that sort of perspective, we have a few good ones, but we must acknowledge at this moment that it's a systemic problem, that corruption is a systemic problem in Jamaica. The system is designed that way. It has not been transformed. Nothing much was done to overhaul the system. Um, during emancipation or after emancipation and independence. So the system remains intact. And we must understand the British were not clean people. Neither are the Americans, right? We tend to believe that um, because that was we learned in schools and that they're more organized and they look that way superficially. But behind the scenes, when you study and you read about the British Empire, you read about the American Empire, you, re you really understand that there is a lot of dirt, right? And there is, are a lot of corruption charges that have been leveled against these formidable empires. Now, this morning, I'm looking at Jamaica, of course, and the Prime Minister Andrew Hodes, and what I call the corruption industrial complex, because that's what we have in Jamaica, corruption industrial complex. Corruption is at the heart of politics. Now, I think what we need to understand is that on both political ends, whether the PNP or the GLP, these people belong to the same boys club or girls club. And they do. They have their boys club and they have their girls club. And they're working for their economic slave masters. So Andrew is not really the head of state as we think he is. He's a prime minister. Yes, he's what we see, the face. He is a guy that you have elected to be prime minister or selected. He, well, you haven't really elected him, but, you know, a member of parliament, um, he's elected and he is the prime minister of the Jamaica Labour Party. But the fact of the matter is that he's controlled by domestic and international economic elites and political elites also. And you must understand that. So Andrew Honus is connected and he's doing the bidding of his slave masters. Now you think that Mark Golding is going to do something different. It's not going to be so because, you know, already so Zara Burton, if you should have read any of her articles on Substack, you would have seen that she posted some article, I think it was this year or last year, in which she said she contacted Mark Golding about also declarations undeclared assets that he might have had in other jurisdictions abroad, right? What we call tax havens. So these prime ministers or these political candidates or, or political leaders are not coming clean with us. They, a lot of them are multi-millionaires. They are what? Multi-millionaires. But they are not going to tell you that. And what they have declared is not really the full extent of their wealth. And that is why it's very, you know, it's high stupidity, I should say, for people to compare Dr. Clark and the ordinary teacher or nurse who is actually suffering and desires to immigrate to another country. Because many of the times these guys are connected to state funds and they're connected to power, you know, structures and, you know, power symbols and political actors on the global stage. And they're able to make lots of money right, through these connections, what we call proxies, right? They do that. And they do this all the time, people. You've got to understand that. But we think that the measly salary that they tell us that they're earning is all that they take home. Now, how would Andrew Holness be able to make such a humongous castle if they, he was just earning the salary of the Prime Minister of Jamaica? He would not be able to do that. And as I have suggested on many occasions, if these guys want millions of dollars, they have to create a big economy. They have to create a prosperous economy. And then I think they would earn the big salaries that some of them are actually getting. But they have not created an economy where in which our GDP or gross domestic product, you know, has increased. It has shrunk instead of increasing. And that is what we are suggesting, that they do not deserve because they're not working 
hard enough, they are not creative enough, they are not innovative enough to expand our economy. But we're hearing that Andrew Honus has how many accounts? Allegedly, 28 accounts, bank accounts. Now, that is something that is unimaginable. It's unthinkable that one prime minister could have joint accounts, you know, amounting to that number. That is incredible. But we it, it's not unthinkable if we reflect on what Andrew Honus did some years ago. Well, not what he did, but what members of his party did. You know, we talked, you know, the administration began with a bang in 2006, I think it was 2017, when the whole matter of corruption charges against Dr. Wheatley came out. And those were corruption charges, which, of course, involved the misappropriation of funds, right, at Petrojack. Then we had in 2000, I think it was in 2019, thereabout, when um, Andrew, not Andrew, but Royal Reed was charged. And remember now that his helper was taxed with, you know, joining an account with him, with opening an account with his name. So he, because he was spreading his financial wins, as it were, that was Royal Reed, the then the former minister of education. And we've had a lot of political allegations. And by the way, nothing has become of these charges. Whether, you know, in fact, these men, particularly Ruel Reed, seems to be prominent men still, and they're earning and pulling down large salaries. Remember now that after Ruel Reed committed this alleged crime, he went back to Jamaica College, thinking that he would have received his job. And of course, they were intelligent enough, right? They were sober enough not to have given him that position, right? But afterwards, he took them to court and he won them, right? And he was able to get huge quantities of money. So Jamaica is corrupt to the core. Corruption lies at the heart of most of our problems. And that is what you know, people like the Martin Henrys and Ian Boyce have said. But they're no longer, these men are no, long, are no longer with us and they cannot really write about, but they're, about what is happening, but their writings, their previous writings are still with us and they still continue to speak to our conscience and our consciousness. And I think that we need a lot of consciousness in Jamaica and in the Caribbean at large, because our politicians behave as if they are dictators and they run the show and we should be kept in the dark. And any democracy, I think there is, uh, that was is a slogan of the Washington Post that democracy dies in darkness. I think that is what they have, right? As their slogan, right? That democracy dies in darkness. And right now, J Jamaica is in total darkness. We don't know what really is happening. We're hearing allegations. We're hearing assertions and rumors here and there, but we are not really hearing what really stands, what really is the position of the National Integrity Association, the Integrity Commission. We really don't know what really is happening there. And everything is also partisan. Everything is political. Everything has been politicized. So it is in fact right, it, it, it is in fact correct when Andrew Honus says that everything about what is happening is politicized, has been politicized. Again, he does the same thing. If he were in opposition, he would have done the same thing because that is what they do. Now, the how the game is played, Jamaicans, is that you have these big boys club and the big women club, whatever you want to call them, right? They, are, they belong to these fraternity and if you want to call them sororities, if you will. Yeah. And what they do they actually go and they congregate and they work for the same people, but they're vying for power. And because they want to maintain the oligarchy, they create this illusion that you have a two-party system. At the end of the day, both political parties are controlled by one economic power, particularly in Jamaica, that we're so, you know, we are, we, we are really a small nation. So we do not have a lot of oligarchs there, right? So the few oligarchs who are there control the two political wings of what we call democracy, which, which are the PNP and the JLP. 
right, political parties. Now, they protect the wealth of these oligarchs. So they pretend as if they're divided and yes, they're vying for power. And the person who is in power has more access to state funds and funds coming from these powerful oligarchs. So right now the PNP, their mouths are watering as it were for funds, for state funds and to be able to enrich themselves, right? Um, from the poverty of many Jamaicans. They, that's what they're, it's about. It's not about Mark Golding or the PNP or KD Knight trying to clean up Jamaica as it were. It's that they are competing, right? These are competing interests, competing economic interests. And the closer they are to the economic oligarchs, then it's the richer they will become. So it's now the PNP time now to get back and to start eating some of the cake. And that's what they're really, you know, holding for. It's not about cleaning up Jamaica because we know when the PNP was in office, the same thing, acts of corruption and the traffic aura and all of these political charges have been sacked. These were very, very corrupt activities and activities and, and, and actions that have not been cleared up in the courts. We must understand too, when we say people say investigation, investigation by whom? Remember, this, these are the same political entities and our judiciary, our organs of government are not separate. They're all interconnected, right? The legislative, right? The executive, the judiciary, all of these are connected. They're all connected. And the, these people, because again, we are such a small country and they form the elites, they share information and they, as much as possible, try to protect the interests of the oligarchs, of Jamaican oligarchs, and also global oligarchs. And that's what we have to understand. This is not going to happen. The, the whole matter surrounding Andrew Holness, even if Andrew Holness should walk tomorrow, is not going to solve the problem of political corruption uh, in Jamaica. It's not going to do that, right? And let us say that he has to pay a fine of 100 million Jamaican dollars. Perhaps that's nothing to for him to pay because perhaps the money that he has, because nobody knows what Andrew Holden's assets really are, his wealth is, because of course his statutory declaration has not been certified because there are, um, what do you call it now, conflicts in terms of who did not register what, the banks are also involved, they did not, they registered something in US dollars when it have been in Jamaican currency. It is just unbelievable how these guys behave, but their modus operandi is actually to confuse you, right? And to make you feel that you are being served by the opposition when it's really controlled opposition. That's what they're doing. So it's not to really solve the problem of political, um, uh, what should I say, chickenery and also political deception and corruption. Right? That's, that's what they're about. These guys are not about solving these problems. They're not about empowering the people. They're not about improving the economic opportunities of Jamaicans. They are about keeping you on the plantation. And it's time for Jamaicans to move away from this party loyalty and begin to question both sides and say something is amiss here. And we need to know what really is happening. Because we know at this juncture of the history that, that both sides have failed us. Be they PNP or GLP, they have failed Jamaicans. Right? And this is why we call it the corruption industrial complex, because that is how the show is run, through corruption. So it's Jamaica by, of, and for corruption. That was That's what we have in Jamaica. Can I probably make a word? Uh, corrupt, corruptocracy. <laughs> corruptocracy. <laughs> I don't think that's a word, right? It's even very hard to pronounce, right? Uh, but help me to pronounce that word. Help me to as it were to you know to contrive to to craft something a word to make up that word right um corrupt corruptocracy something like that Jama um, jamaica is that sort of corrupt state corruption for and by and of the people
<laughs> or of the politician which what which do you think we should say corruption of and by and for the politicians right not for the people because then it would be democracy <laughs> you know it's it, you know i'm just trying to come up with some you know innovative sort of idea of ideology however it is interesting to note that mr andrew Holness is now trying to blame you know the fact that oh um he's under threat so he's trying to act like a victim and that is why you had that drama of the security forces going to his house and trying to protect him but what is very important for jamaicans to watch also is the curtailment of your freedom of expression freedom of speech because when you see them doing that and you they make laws that the prime minister's life is under threat then they might control the information that you are bringing to the fore, even if that information is valid and legitimate and accurate. But they will tell you that it's misinformation, it's disinformation to shut information down, right? And to actually um, suppress the truth. And that is what I think that they are actually doing at the moment, the suppression of truth, right? And truth is not coming from the PNP or the JLP, as a matter of fact. You will see elements of it on both sides, but also there are lots of cover-ups. And we, the citizens, are the ones who have to look at the information for ourselves. Lots of things are also, be, uh, are also hidden, are also concealed. So we don't have access to all the facts. And that's why we're, people are saying Andrew Holden should resign. But if we don't have access to all the facts, we can't say that he should resign because maybe the entire government should resign. As it were, you know, we need a government, but the, the entire system that we have now should be overhauled and we should have, you know, a, a clean state. But we know that that's impossible because the system is so much embedded as it were that corruption is embedded, is entrenched in the system, that's it's going to be very difficult now to uphold the system because if we uphold it, if you overhaul it, as you'd say, not uphaul, but overall haul it, then the entire system is going to come down, I should say, uproot. If we uproot the system, if we overhaul it, then the entire machinery is going to come down, tumbling down, and it's going to you know, wind up as the French Revolution um, did in the period of 1789 to 1798, which is not going to be good. So I don't know what is it that, how we can fix the system, how we can actually reform the system is something that I don't know. You know, when Bruce Golding in the 1990s attempted to do it, he realized that he couldn't. He realized that the economic elites would not have allowed him to have made reformations in that system. And that's why he ended up going back to the JLP because they would just not allow him, right? And then you know what happened to him having gone back and having had to make compromise, compromises, and he eventually had a political fall. Is only time that will tell whether or not Andrew Holness will also have or experience something similar to what happened to Golden, to Bruce Golding. I don't know if that will happen. I don't know. I don't know if Katie Knight will put a lot of pressure on him. Katie Knight is really a humorous person. He says that I have had inquiries, and I have, you know, and I can assure you, according to him, that Andrew Holness has his bag. <laughs> Andrew Holness has, you know, obtained his bag, and it's now time for him to pack. He's recommending that Andrew Holness packs the bag and go reside. So I don't know if K.D. Knight, who is an outstanding lawyer, if he will put a lot of political pressure on Andrew Honus to resign. Lots of strange developments, right? We see where Dr. Nigel Clark is now heading to Washington amidst all of these charges of corruption of the prime minister and their friends. And we say birds of a feather flock together. So I think it's also time and it's fair. I'm not suggesting though that, that Nigel Clark has corruption charges against him, but I think it's fair since given the fact that he and the prime minister are very close friends, they are you know, close bodies, that he should also be investigated 
before he goes to Washington, D.C., before he goes off to the IMF. The entire ministry and his stewardship of the Jamaican economy should also be investigated. It merits a proper objective analysis of what uh, Gadger Clark has done, his stewardship of the Ministry of Finance. But I doubt this is gonna is gonna happen. I think he's just going to be just silently leaving. And after he has left, then corruption charges are going to be leveled against him. <laughs> when he would have already been at the International Monetary Fund. I think that's what is going to happen. So while we're now, you know, rendering and bestowing upon him, you know, these sort of glowing um, tributes, I think that when he goes to Washington, we are going to begin now to say that he did this and he did that, but that will be too late because he would have already left us, hopefully. He will not be leaving with any monies or things that Jamaicans need. Right? Because we can't trust these guys, you know. We can't trust these guys. The, our politicians cannot be trusted. Right? We call them our leaders, but they cannot be trusted. And we have to watch everything that they are doing. But we have not been vigilant enough. And that is why we're seeing the crisis that we're going through right now and people are you know crying and they're thinking that if andrew bonus goes tomorrow if they see his back tomorrow and another person replaces him at jamaica house that things are just going to change and we are going to be satisfied but yeah andrew bonus will be leaving with all of his accomplishments and attainments and let me say something to you and i'm no andrew bonus fan but andrew bonus entered politics when he was young, and he really has mastered the art or the science of politics, whatever you want to call it, an art or science. He has mastered that art, right? He does, well, they say political science, I would think it's a science. Don't, don't understand how it's a science, but you know, let's call it a science, right? So he has mastered the science of politics. He has, and if he leaves tomorrow, let us look at Andrew Fonis as a young man coming to politics, becoming prime minister after Bruce Golding left. He was 39 when he became, for a brief time, prime minister of Jamaica in, in 2011. You know, after that, he was challenged by, in turn, he was challenged by Aldi Shaw and Dr. Peter, um, Dr. Christopher Tufton and some other guys in the JLP. He won them twice. And he became, he ultimately became Prime Minister of Jamaica in 2016. And the guy has just been growing, right? He has been growing politically, financially, in every way, educationally, because he just obtained his, his doctorate, right? So he has used the political machinery very well. You have to give him his credit. So if he should go tomorrow, if you should see his back tomorrow, he has gained. You are the ones who would have lost, but he has gained a lot, a lot of money, a lot of political connections, right? He's more powerful than how he was some years ago by the connections that he has formed. And I have told you that I think just like his friend Nigel Clark, that he is moving on to higher heights. He might be going to a multilateral institution to work for them, right? Because he has this thing in law and legal public, public policy. That's what he got his doctorate in, right? So he, obviously he's moving in that direction, right? So don't think because he might resign or he might lose the election when the election is called. I think that's what the PNP is trying to do. I don't think he's going to resign. I think that they're trying to say you must call the election because if he should call the election today, chances are the PNP would win the election given the fact that he is under investigation. So they could use that as a political ball against the JLP that their leaders have stolen funds. I mean, he has um, illicit enrichment, you know, money, right? So the fact of the matter is that this is what it's all about. This is not about 
really cleaning the state. The media, what are they doing? It seems to me that we have to look carefully at the Integrity Commission, and it should be that the laws have to be reformed with regard to whether or not the media can interview them, can be a watchdog over what they're doing, because it should serve as a watchdog. I think the media should and should be able to interview them and to examine their documents to see if what they're reporting or not reporting are accurate or, you know, are, are consistent with information that they have told us and the activities that these political leaders have declared or have been alleged to have engaged in, sorry, not declared because they they would have declared their assets, but you know all of the financial activities that is on their statutory declarations would have been consistent with what is you know what what is on the document, consistent with their declarations, right? I think the media have a lot of job to do as far as that is concerned, but we're depending on the on the um. The Integrity Commission, and they are also politicized. It's, it's also a political organization. And the media is also political too, is also partisan. So I don't think we are going to win this game, ladies and gentlemen. I don't think we are going to win this game. I just had pulled up here, I don't think I'm seeing it right now, an article that the the I think I have it here, that the um Guardian had written. Some last year about the Caribbean and corruption. Let me see if I can share this with you because our politicians are corrupt in Jamaica and in the, the world at large. But this article was actually looking at the Caribbean region specifically. Right? So let me just open this and show you what they are saying. All right, so we have here the Caribbean region stretches from the Bahamas to Trinidad and Tobago and can be said to include non-island countries from Belize to Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana. It is home to some of the wealthiest politicians in the world. Yet the ever popular posts on social media about the richest or best paid in the region tend to ignore the most that most of the millionaire and billionaire politicians of Trinidad and Tobago and other islands. So they tend to ignore how they actually got their money. It is interesting to see the net worth of these politicians and shocking that some were of average wealth, only becoming millionaires or billionaires since taking office. Meanwhile, the citizens who voted them into power have become poorer, more disempowered, and more disfranchised. Now, this is what we talk about when we say that we are a democracy. Right? Shouldn't a democracy be empowering us and seeking to help us to improve on our economic law? No, it's to make us poorer and become more disfranchised or disenfranchised, as you know, as it were, and to make us more disempowered. And that is exactly what the reality in Jamaica is. Let's look briefly before we end the video on a few more. Sentences coming from this article. Now, how did these politicians get so wealthy? That's the question being asked by the writer of this article in the Guardian newspaper, the UK Guardian newspaper, by the way. I believe some have done it legitimately as professionals in other fields. Others have profited as politicians using insider information and receiving contracts through proxies such as wives, friends, and colleagues, and some through kickbacks and bribes. One ongoing corruption case in the region involves Michael Misik, premier of Turks and Caicos, a British overseas territory. Misik resigned in 2009 when a UK commission found a high probability of systemic corruption amounting to 75 million pounds sterling in the sale of crown lands. Right, so this these are the corruption charges that we have been seeing. Corruption in the Caribbean has shown no improvement over the last decade, as we seem to be content to have set up shop at the bottom of the CPI. 
That's the corruption perception index, I think. That's what they say. In terms of points, with 100 as a perfect score, Barbados dropped from 76 in 2012 to 65. So even Barbados is, is, is getting more corrupt. The Bahamas from 71 to 64, and St. Lucia from 71 to an astonishing 55, right? Some islands have been consistent in achieving low scores on the CPI as democracy continues to be eroded, moving steadfastly to autocracy. All right, I'm going to re repeat that because some of you, when I talk to you, you think that I'm not thinking. You think that, what is this guy saying? Because we are a democracy, right? Jamaica is a democracy. So what is he saying that Jamaica is a democracy? But let me read this, right? Some islands have been consistent in achieving low scores on the CPI as democracy continues to be eroded, moving steadfastly to autocracy where the political and business elite has captured the legislature and law enforcement. And the question is being asked here, what of the watchdogs charged with leading the anti-corruption fight in this region. The results show they lack meaningful influence in creating change, right? So this integrity commission is lacking influence in creating change because they are a part of the systemic corruption in the society. If the truth be told, they are a part of that sort of corruption because it is the lifeblood of the Caribbean economy, corruption. Now listen to what they're saying here. Take the islands ranked poorly in the Caribbean, Cuba, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Suriname, the Dominican Republic, and Haiti. There has been no significant improvement over the last decade in any of these countries except for Guyana, which moved up from a score of 28 in 2012 to 40 in 2022. So that's good. They have that a significant improvement from 28 to 40. No doubt, its recent discovery of large oil deposits may send it back down if that wealth is allowed to be exploited by its politicians, which we know is going to be exploited by its politicians and by business experts from its salivating neighbors. All right? And they're asking, what of the watchdogs, the social activists? the financial intelligence units, the integrity commissions, the other agencies and organizations charged with leading the anti-corruption fight in this region. The results show they lack meaningful influence in creating change. In creating change. Transparency International has, over the last two decades, done an amazing job in bringing awareness to global corruption issues. However, TI itself is not without criticism in the Caribbean region, right? And we see all of that. So this is what this is where we are now, people, right? Repeatedly, we have seen nepotism, fraud, bribery, kickbacks, conflicts of interest, revolving door syndrome, and all these forms of corruption being normalized in the Caribbean with absolutely no outrage or protests by the citizens and taxpayers of these islands because they're dancing. Let's get to get the right, feel all right. And we think that the our governments are the ones running the show. And Andrew Polis have to stop it. Him have to stop it, right? And, you know, I, I think we don't understand that this is a systemic problem. Not to mention the utter mismanagement of public funds and vanity projects uh, awarding unqualified contractors resulting in poor infrastructure, the corrupting influence of political financiers, and the gifting of public contracts to wives and girlfriends and friends and family. Because as so the system set up. That is how the system is designed, and that is how it was meant to be. Right? This is how it was meant to be. This is how it was meant to be. The Caribbean region, Jamaica particular, Jamaica specifically, is corrupt, right? Corrupt. And this democracy that we're talking about, because you're going to your fiesta and you elect a prime minister or a party, I should say political party, every five years or so, 
does mean therefore that you are living in a democracy. Because if a real democracy is one in which the citizens are aware, they are vigilant, because as the Washington Post suggests in a slogan, democracy dies in darkness. And the Caribbean region for the most part is going through a period of darkness, of political darkness, right? I think we need to read more about geopolitics. We need to study more about our system. We need to study more history to see how our systems were designed. Because if we don't understand how the system functions, then we can't see clearly through what is happening from day to day. And we're just looking at personalities, political actors, when we should be looking at the system. And who really is behind the politicians in Jamaica? At least the Americans know when they talk about big pharma and they talk about big business and they talk about big oil. What big whatever is in Jamaica? We can talk about the big what? The big oligarchs? They are behind the politicians. Who are the names behind these things? At least Americans talk about Bill Gates and they talk about the Rockefellers and, you know, and all these people. We have not been talking about our elites and how they have controlled the political machinery and have been controlling the political machinery and they find us to be contemptuous. Right? They do not like the citizens of Jamaica, just like you have the Haitian elites who do not like the Haitian, the normal Haitian citizen, because they run the show. They think they're more sophisticated. They're wealthier. They live in better houses. And Andrew Holness, though he's coming from the bowels of the working class, has aligned himself with these elites. And most of our political leaders have done that, including our academic elites. So the Jamaicans, for the most part, will remain on the plantation, on the plantation, because they think that is where your your you be married. That's a place that you should stay, stay in your lane, stay in your place, and don't you ever dare challenge the political machinery in JA and in the Caribbean at large. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you like and you share and you subscribe. Remember now to like and share the videos because we have to educate our people. We've got to study this political machinery in Jamaica as well as the Caribbean. 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 This is not only a Jamaican problem. This is a Caribbean, a Latin American, a global problem, the problem of political corruption. All the best to you. See you then. Have a great day.